guys. So this is the what we would consider to be the second half of research in terms of notes. This is the experimental method or just experimentation in general. Again, this is going to be a lot of me explaining, so it's very important that you write down for yourselves additional information that's on that handout. Don't just leave it blank. Guarantee that what I say to you will show up on the exam um, or on the unit test in some way, shape, or form. So very important that you keep that in mind. All right. So one of the big things that we talked about with our last set on descriptive research is that it doesn't give us any level of cause and effect. We don't get the why behind behaviors and what they are or that there is a relationship between two things. We don't get the the, the background, so to speak, on what experiments provide to us that descriptive research don't. So, experimentation is the backbone of what psychology does. We'll complete descriptive research, but really and truly what we're going to do is look at experimentation in order to really determine cause and effect. Okay, So, examples of famous experiments that have been done. Pavlov's dogs. Um, this is how we ended up developing, by accident, an understanding of something called classical conditioning that we'll move into when we get to Unit 6. Uh, Milgram's obedience study. This is what I've alluded to just a tiny bit in class about the issue of whether a person will obey a perceived authority figure um, when it involves inflicting harm on another person. In that case, it was electric shock. And then you have something called Ash's conformity study, which involved how willing we are to adhere to a particular response or person's opinion, even if we don't agree that it's right. Um, so we'll, we'll get into those a whole lot more later on in much more depth. So again, cannot stress this enough. Start for yourself, do whatever you need to, but experiment is the only method that gives us cause and effect, okay? The why and the how. So, multiple different aspects to an experiment to keep in mind for yourselves. And the first, the, stuch, the starting off point, or the touch off point, is a hypothesis, okay? Our testable prediction, the educated guess. We've talked about these before. So let's say, for example, that you want to test if caffeine helps keep high school teachers alert and happy, okay? So what you want to do then is test the effects of this caffeine on a high school teacher's temperament and their behavior. Now before you end up proceeding, you have to create something called an operational definition. That's something down here, okay, that provides you with aspects of your experiment. So by that we mean that you have to define what constitutes caffeine and what constitutes uh, happiness and alertness because not everyone is going to measure it the same way. So an operational definition gives you the ability to determine right off the bat, this is what is going to be my definition of caffeine. Is it a, an energy drink? Is it coffee? Is it a pill? Um, and whether your teacher is focused, alert, attentive, and in a positive mood. So who's your population? Obviously, it's going to be high school teachers. It is a fairly specific population, okay? But in this scenario, it's not like a quasi-experiment because you will have a true control group and a true experimental group. Um, and we'll move into what those mean in a second. Okay, specifically, we're going to take a look at Oak Hill's high school teachers, okay? We're going to talk about them in terms of this little experiment that we're running. So you need a representative sample of your high school teacher population. So, this is the key component that quasi-experiments are missing. Their, their populations aren't representative or random, okay? So, what would a representative sample look like? Just a small snapshot of teachers here, excuse me, of teachers here at the high school. It would be from teachers all over, different genders, different ages, different subject matters, okay? Even different number of years that they've been here. So a random sample enables us to ensure that every person in a population has an equal shot of being selected, okay? Another way to go about doing this is something called a stratified sample. In that scenario, the population that you have, it's divided into certain subcategories, and then the random sampling is taken from each one of those categories. So you have just a little bit of 
representation from each one of those groups. So let's say to get your random sample, you put all of the teachers' names in the school in a hat and you just pick out 50 names. You've got your random sample. Everyone had an equal shot at being selected. And a stratified sample, you would divide the staff into categories like we discussed earlier. Male versus female, new teachers versus veteran teachers, subject areas, English, math, social studies, etc., etc. Now, when I talk control and experimental groups, absolutely crucial that you understand the differentiations between these. And we'll move into doing examples um, when we come into class together um, as one group so that way we can really go over and kind of hammer home these main points. The experimental group of an experiment is the group that gets special treatment. Okay, so this is a manipulated group. So they're going to be uh, experiencing something with regard to the independent variable. Okay, their, their group is and their behavior is going to be what we determine a lot of our results on. So let's say group A becomes your experimental group. They are participants that end up drinking two cups of regular, which is caffeinated coffee, every day in the morning for a month. Okay. Now your control group is your comparison group. So this is a group that you establish that does not get special treatment. There is no manipulation to what they go through at all, okay? So group B gets two cups of decaf coffee every morning for a month, but they don't know whether they're getting decaf or regular coffee. They just know that they're getting something that is providing them with caffeine. Your random assignment, once you get your sample, you have to not only provide a, you know, a random group of the participants, you also have to have random assignments. So by that we mean a participant has an equal shot at getting put in either the experimental group, the group that gets manipulated and gets special treatment, or the control group, the group that's our, our base, basically, the group that we're going to compare everyone else to because they don't get any special treatment. They're just normal, okay? This enables you to be able to minimize any possible pre-existing differences or issues between the two groups that you're studying. How we do this in an experiment is that once we've gathered participants, we can just hand out numbered cards to no particular order of things, and then we can basically establish numbers from that to give some level of experimental control. Another key component to experimental methods are the independent and dependent variables. So, so critical that you keep these separate from one another and can differentiate between them. They will come up on that AP exam over and over and over again. So they'll be heavily emphasized on the unit one test. Your independent variable is considered to be your cause, okay? So this is what's gonna be manipulated by the experimenter who uh, is attempting to study the effect. Okay, so in our experiment of caffeine and its effect on teachers' alertness levels and happiness, what's being manipulated is the type of drink, whether it's caffeinated or decaffeinated. Okay, we know it's going to be coffee. We keep it that way so that way everyone thinks they're having the same thing. But what's being manipulated is the caffeine within the coffee. Is it decaf? Is it not? The dependent variable is the effect of the experiment. So therefore it depends on the manipulation that was done in the independent variable. It's the factor that's going to change as a result. So it's your effect. Usually, and this is one of the easiest ways for you to help yourselves remember the difference between independent and dependent variable, the dependent variable is going to be a behavior or a mental process. Okay, so anytime there's a scenario where something is being manipulated and a person's attitudes or actions are affected, those attitudes and actions typically will be your dependent variable that was being studied. So for our purposes then, it's the behavior. Alertness level of the teachers, their crankiness, um, whether or not they're pleasant to be around. So these are the breakdowns of independent and dependent variables. My question to you, how do you measure alertness or crankiness? How do we go about establishing that for ourselves in order to make sure that our operational definition of alertness and happiness in teachers is truly what we say we're measuring? What you could do is fill out questionnaires, have teachers complete these, so that way you can ensure through a relatively even means that teachers are answering 
uh, the exact same questions, that you are measuring the exact same things from each person, and that way you can get some baseline data for yourselves maybe at the end of each month, and that way you can truly determine is there a change in any manner to teachers' alertness levels or not. All right, you've heard me mention placebos before. A placebo is a fake treatment. That's what I mean when we say pseudo, okay? It's not real. We use placebos a lot of times in order to make sure that the effect of an independent variable is truly just that, that there is an effect. If, for example, you're doing drug testing and the chemical within the drug is what you are testing, you need to make sure that really is that drug having an effect on a person's behavior and their physical well-being or is the person uh, experiencing something called the placebo effect where they must be, for whatever reason, believing that they're receiving an actual treatment itself so their behaviors alter as a result. So for us, the placebo is the decaf coffee because it's not going to have an effect on people. For most drug research, what you're going to have is a sugar pill. Okay, It's a sugar and water, but it's made to look identically to the drug that you are attempting to test. So if you're looking at an Alzheimer's drug and you're doing an experiment, you will give your control group, the group that's being manipulated, you'll give them the actual Alzheimer's drug, and then your control group they will receive the placebo pill, that sugar pill. Neither group will know um, necessarily which one they are involved in, and that gets into single and double blind studies to reduce bias. We'll move into that in a bit. In a single blind, participants don't know what's going on. They're not sure whether they're getting um, you know, manipulated or not, but the researcher can often find that out. Here's the issue where this is concerned. Which one is better? Because teachers don't know what group they're in, which is good because they aren't necessarily going to know um, what kind of treatment they're receiving if they really are having an effect on their behavior. As opposed to the double blind, where the teachers nor the person gathering the data know. But why would a double blind study be better Think about that? Why is it important to make sure that a researcher doesn't necessarily know who's in what group? Think about it, write it down for me on your notes, so that way we can make sure that we go over it a bit in class with one another together. Okay, one last thing to keep in mind, and we are going to beat you over the head with this particular issue. Confounding variables. Confounding variables are parts of an experiment that could factor into why your results are the way that they are, but that we're not factored into your experiment. So by that we mean that there's something outside of the independent variable that could be causing a particular behavior to continue or stop or that could in general just affect the outcomes of your experiment. So what we need to ask ourselves is what could be some confounding variables f that factor into this experiment? If you think about it, decaf coffee still has some level of caffeine in it. And caffeine is a psychoactive drug that, that contributes to levels of increased alertness. So a person is still ingesting caffeine, there is still going to be some level of influence on them, even if it is just decaf. Experience prior to the experiment with caffeine. If you have an incredibly high tolerance for caffeine, like me, I drink a lot during the school year, so I end up increasing the amount of caffeine that I need to get every day in order to feel the same effects that earlier doses would have had on me. Um, so if you're not a regular coffee drinker, you might not need a whole lot of caffeine in your system to be very, very alert. Um, but you could have very high tolerances, so you need a lot more. Your amount of sleep factors into things too. If you didn't get enough sleep the night before, you're probably going to be kind of grumpy. If you've had extended periods of time without sleep, you'll probably be even more grumpy. And so that lends itself to the aspect of your happiness levels. So that is the end of the experimentation notes. We will move further into this when we get together in class to make sure that you understand the content. I would highly, highly recommend that you pause this set of notes, go back through again, and write down additional information from what I said, not just what's on the handout. 
the more that you write for yourself in terms of these notes, the better prepared you're going to be for the test. And it's absolutely critical to your success on the AP exam. If you got any questions, just let me know.